Our next speaker is Murphy Liu, class of 2018. Murphy graduated from Rutgers University in 2011 with majors in neuroscience and physics and minors in music and psychology. He has always had diverse interests, everything from math to painting to philosophy, and is always looking for ways to integrate seemingly disparate fields. Currently, he's pursuing clinical research to develop digital apps for improving autism screening and diabetes health literacy. Murphy has participated in the MedTalks committee for two years and is excited to be standing on the other side of the stage. Please join me in welcoming Murphy. There was a time in my life where I wrote profusely, every day writing pages and pages about my life and experiences, poring over every sentence, every word, aiming for literary perfection. That time in my life was known as medical school applications. <laughs> now, the reason I bring this up is because one of the recurring topics of my medical school essays was the art of medicine. Like most of the other naive pre-meds on studentdoctors.net, I wrote about how I was sure to succeed at med school because it would be exactly like my years of training in painting. At first, you start with the basics. In art, it's shading circles. In medicine, taking a blood pressure. Then you rehearse these contrived scenarios so that you don't make a fool of yourself in front of real people. Uh, in art, you draw these weird wooden people. And in medicine, you practice the phrase, that must be really hard for you. Please, tell me more. <laughs> Finally, uh, just like in art, how the teacher will take your seat and repaint everything that you just did, in medicine, the attending will give you a blank stare, say that your answer was stupid, and question how you even got into medical school. <laughs> Kidding. Sort of. <laughs> uh, now, as goofy as that analogy may be, I hope you can agree that my precocious pre-med self was onto something. You see, in art, anyone can look at a painting and see its beauty, but to truly appreciate it, you need to understand history, technique, psychology, and most importantly, sharing one's perspective. As participators in MedTalks, I hope you agree that medicine is the same, that sharing one's perspective can elevate good medicine into extraordinary medicine. And so today, I would like to share with you my perspective on how the least artistic sounding most pedantic subject that we learned in medical school is, in fact, a form of art. Yes, I'm talking about evidence-based medicine. <laughs> now, some of you have already started to doze off at the mere mention of EBM, but I promise that I'll do my best to make this exciting. Throughout this med talk, I'm going to show you how, like art, understanding EBM requires learning about ethics, psychology, statistics, and more. We'll be doing thought experiments, uh, running polls, uh, discussing history, and even doing some math. By the end, hopefully I can convince you that studying EBM is worth it, even after you've gotten that fancy MD. Like any good talk, I need to start by explaining what EBM is. Now I know you're thinking, oh, Murphy, I know what EBM is. So I won't go through the textbook definition. Rather, I'd like to explain EBM with a thought experiment, the trolley problem. Imagine that you're standing in front of some railroad tracks. In the distance is a runaway trolley barreling towards four people tied up on the tracks. Now at this point you're probably wondering, how to get stuck in the plot of a silent movie? But there's no time to figure that out now because in front of you there's also a lever that if pulled will change the course of the train. The problem is it leads into a dark tunnel. And more importantly, you don't know how many other people you might be putting at risk. So with three seconds to decide, you need to figure out whether it's ethical to pull that lever. Three, two, one. So, who pulled the lever? You see, this is what medicine was like before the advent of EBM. We saw a problem. Millions of women were suffering from pregnancy nausea. We found a solution, thalidomide. The issue was improperly controlled experiments and uh, were sending us barreling into a dark tunnel with no thought of adverse events or controlling for bias. Sometimes those tunnels were empty, but most of the time they weren't. And worst of all, 
sometimes we end up harming more people than we helped. In the aforementioned example, prescribing thalidomide caused millions of babies to be born with severe limb and neural defects. And so, EBM was a light that illuminated the darkness. All right, back to the trolley problem. Same setup, four people in front of you, uh, the lever that'll change the course of the train. Only this time, you see that the other track only has two people. Again, three seconds to decide. Three, two, one. So, who pulled the lever this time? That decision may have been easier, but it still wasn't easy. I mean, the utilitarian view says that pulling the lever will lead to a net savings of two lives, and therefore is the ethical solution. But the utilitarian view feels callous. I mean, what if on that track were a six-year-old child? What if it were your mother or your worst enemy? What if it was the President of the United States or the President of the United States from before January 20th? <laughs> your answers may have changed, but should they have? You see, as physicians, these are decisions that we make every day. Every therapy has a number needed to treat and a number needed to harm. Some drugs, like aspirin after a heart attack, have phenomenal benefit-to-risk profiles, making it an easy decision. You know that prescribing it will help a lot more people than you harm. Other common drugs, such as statins, have profiles that are closer to this trolley problem. That means, yes, every time you decide to prescribe a statin, you decide that preventing four heart attacks is worth two serious adverse events. Imagine if, uh, imagine if every time you saw a patient, you had to run through a mini trolley problem with number needed to treat on track one and number needed to harm on track two. You never get through the day in terms of time and emotional fortitude. That's where EBM comes in. No, EBM isn't making the decision for you, but it is guiding your hand on the lever allowing you to choose the ethical solution. Without it, you're choosing to ignore who's in that tunnel. All right, Murphy, you've convinced me already. I'm totally gonna make sure to pay attention to EBM now. I like your enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, it's not that simple. You see, uh, try as you may, the human mind is naturally resistant to evidence, particularly when it doesn't fit our worldview. There's a prime example that plagues medicine, the anti-vax movement. You know the story. A concerned mother walks in. Uh, she, you could patiently present a 100-page thesis on why uh, vaccines are important and don't cause autism. But let's be real, it would have less impact than a two-minute Jenny McCarthy video. That's because you know that interesting stories are inherently more impactful than facts and figures. This is known as belief perseverance. Now, it's easy to think that this is a phenomenon of poor science education. Uh, but in fact, this is a human phenomenon that, yes, even physicians fall prey to. There are plenty of examples I could give, but I'd like to take a step back in time to the Civil War. After witnessing thousands of soldiers die from post-op infections, a promising young surgeon named Dr. Joseph Lister pioneered an idea that he knew would save millions. That idea was sterile surgery. It may seem obvious to us now, but at the time, surgeons prided themselves on their unwashed operating gowns, referring to the good old surgical stink as a display of their experience. For over 20 years, the sterile surgery was deemed too inconvenient, impersonal, and something only for surgeons with OCD. For over 20 years, despite the evidence, we let thousands of patients die due to our belief, perseverance, and ego. Well, I can keep talking. Uh, so this is known as the implementation gap, which is the time it takes for a discovery, there we go, discovery to make it to day-to-day -day practice. Uh, now, in the 21st century, with all of our instant communication and systems to ensure quality care, you'd expect that this gap would have decreased. And it has. The average is now 17 years. You see, as technology improves, that gap will continue to shorten, but the rate limiting factor will ultimately be human psychology. Maybe you're skeptical. You're thinking uh, that th 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 these facts and figures weren't convincing. After all, that's kind of the point I'm trying to make here. Uh, so let's try stories instead. 
Have you ever seen a physician order a test that's not indicated because they missed a diagnosis when they were younger? Have you ever seen a surgeon do a procedure in an unorthodox manner because that's just the way they were taught? Have you ever read a paper and gone, well, this is stupid, without actually evaluating the quality of the evidence? I know I have. My point here is not to say that we're hopeless victims to human psychology, but that these are just some of the ways that your mind can trick you into not offering the best care for your patients. And the only way to fight it is to acknowledge that these flaws in your judgment exist. Man, Murphy, you're dramatic. I get it, I'll read EBM like gospel. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's still not that simple. Uh, this year, the Chinese FDA reported that over 80% of its submissions had gross scientific error or falsification. Now, it's easy to think, this is America. We have honor and scientific integrity here. That would never happen, but we're not that far off. Uh, you see, as you may know, American academia is governed by three unspoken principles. The first, publish or perish, states that researchers who don't publish results don't keep their jobs. Now, normally this isn't a huge deal, except that the second principle is that only positive results get published, giving us a publish positive or perish. This actually leads to statistical aberrations that make our body of research almost laughable. Let me explain. Let's assume that this month, a thousand uh, studies were performed, all perfectly designed, free from ethical mishap or falsification. Let's say that a quarter of these were positive and three quarters were negative. Then, using our standard conventions of alpha equals 0 0.05 and beta equals 0 0.20, we may get about 38 false positives and 50 false negatives. And because only positive results are published, this is what we're left with. A body of work where over 15% of the results may be false positives. Imagine if you were studying for step one and one sixth of the facts in first aid were false. <laughs> I know for me, I wouldn't touch that thing with a 10 foot pole. But this is the scientific research that we base our knowledge off of. And remember, all these studies are perfectly designed, which means just by reading it, there's no way to tell that it's a false positive. It's just a statistical aberration. Now, the third, uh, the scientific method normally circumvents this with the idea of reproducibility. But the third principle of academia is that reproduction results are never published, and therefore they're almost never performed. This leads to a snowball effect. See this hypothesis over here? It's a really interesting hypothesis that a lot of people have had. And so every time it pops up into someone's head, they do a quick lit search and find, hey, no one's studied this yet. Here's my time to shine. And so they perform the experiment, cannot reject the null, and nothing gets published. But the cycle continues and continues and continues until that 5% false positive rate pops up, and suddenly you get a paper. Add a couple more of these interesting hypotheses, and that 15% goes up. Now, I want to clarify that all this is an oversimplification of the math, but research has shown that 15% might be an underestimate. Man, Murphy, you just made this real depressing. First you tell me that I need to pay attention to the evidence to be an ethical physician, but that I can't trust my judgments. And then you tell me that I can't even trust the research? This is why I hated learning EBM. I'm so confused. If that's how you feel, good. I want you to feel something. Like art, EBM should fill you with this ineffable set of emotions. Sometimes you'll be filled with wonder at the beauty of a paper that is gonna save millions of lives. And sometimes you'll be filled with confusion as to why we can't figure out such a seemingly simple problem. Evidence isn't black and white. Uh, it constantly teeters on the brink of antiquity and convention. It ebbs and flows with nuance and complexity. It dances, taking steps forward, but sometimes taking steps back. If I'm making it sound like evidence is alive, that's because it is. It constantly grows and evolves. It exists because it wants to be evaluated, to be critiqued. So, how do you do it? How do you become an expert on EBM? 
Well, if I were giving this talk on painting, I would have said, you can be taught how to paint, but you can't be taught how to be a painter. And so you can learn to hold a brush, how to mix colors, how to layer your images, but there's this beautiful complexity to painting that can't be explicitly taught, the art of painting. It's just something that comes with lots of practice and some self-introspection. And so the only advice I have to give is to the M1s and 2s, learn your basics well, your sensitivities and positive predictive values. Use those skills to evaluate papers. Evaluate, not read. Because sooner than you think, your evaluations will be saving lives. To the M3s and 4s, you should be presenting papers all the time, so present your art. Include your analysis of the study, and when you do, make sure to mention that it's a retrospective cohort. Attendings love that. Uh, to the physicians in the room, sometimes we do read science like it's gospel, with blind faith. We assume some, someone smarter than me wrote this, so who am I to question it? So show us that sometimes our thoughts aren't that stupid, and maybe we do deserve to be in medical school. And to the non-medical people in the audience, thanks for staying awake. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to leave you with one last contrived analogy. Back in 1876, the breakthrough moment for sterile surgery came when Dr. Joseph Lister gave a presentation to an audience of physicians. In the audience was a young entrepreneur who, enthralled with the idea of sterile surgery, used it to start his new medical device company. That entrepreneur was Robert Wood Johnson. Mr. Johnson was so successful that not only did sterile surgery become the convention, but soon we started calling it just surgery. On the other hand, the term evidence-based medicine was coined in 1987, a child by comparison. And like a child who got their vaccines, it's growing without delay. <laughs> Every day, it's, its beauty grows, a beauty that will not only allow, allow us to save millions of lives, but to bring medicine into a new era. And so although, although none of you may be future Robert Wood Johnsons, and I am definitely no Dr. Lister, I believe that one day, we can make evidence-based medicine just called medicine.